So today's theme is building a circular economy for paper and packaging in Ontario. And we're it's the presentation of the Circular Economy Innovation Lab. My name is Chris Lindbergh and I'm the director of SEAL. As I said, we've been welcoming people to introduce themselves in the chat bar, um, say who their, their name are and where they're from, so you can get a sense of who else is on the line. We're expecting about 90 participants today. So we're very excited about the diversity of interest. Our agenda, I'll give a bit of an overview of the Circular Economy Innovation Lab for everybody, and then we'll jump into our, the vision for the future of printed paper and packaging in Ontario, and have five perspectives from different, or four perspectives, sorry, from different um, parts of the printed paper packaging system. We have Jake Westerhoff from Canada Fibers, uh, a waste management company, an urban mining company, John Coyne from Unilever, Ian Ferguson from Chandler Packaging, and Brendan Seal from IKEA Canada. Then we'll, we'll close up with a bit of thoughts on where Seal's going next and uh, time for a Q&A session with everybody. So maybe what we'll also do, just take a moment, we've got people introducing themselves through the poll, through the uh, chat. I'd like to do a quick poll here to get a sense of who all we have on the line. Um, so I'm going to launch this polling function. It should jump up, and you should be able to, to vote in terms of uh, how you heard about this webinar and where you're based. So we'll just see how this functionality works. It's our first time using it. So just click in the polling box that's popped up to vote, and then we'll share these results with everybody else. So I'll just give a couple more minutes. We'll do a few polls as we move through the session. So this is just an easy warm-up one for everyone to get familiar with it. All right, I'll just leave another 10 seconds to vote before we close this off if you're still getting used to it. And for those who have just joined us, we've also invited people to introduce themselves through the chat functionality as well, so you can get a sense of who is on the line. So I'm going to close the polling here, and you should be able to, to see the results. So we have um, people really uh, hearing about this webinar from their, their, predominantly from their network, and we have about half people from the greater Toronto and Hamilton area, some people from uh, southern Ontario, uh, some people outside of Canada and, uh, and other parts of Canada. So just wanted to do that to familiarize everyone with the, with the polling functionality here. And now we'll move on to um, another part of the presentation. So I'd like to start by giving everyone an overview of the Circular Economy Innovation Lab and, and the work we're doing. So we are a process that has been convened by the Natural Step Canada uh, with support from leading organizations from um, across Ontario and Canada, Unilever, Canadian Tire, the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation, Canada's National Brewers, the Ontario Waste Management Association, Celestica, Smart Prosperity Institute, Interface, Bank of Montreal, IKEA, the Government of Ontario, WP Warehousing, Owens, Illinois, and the region of Peel. Uh, so we're very gracious to their support, both financially and through our steering committee and our technical advisory committee. And a word about the Natural Step. We're a national nonprofit organization that's part of a global network of groups working to accelerate the transition to a sustainable society. The core of our work is we have a science and systems thinking based framework for sustainability that's been used by hundreds of organizations around the world. And we deliver three core programs. We deliver training and sustainability, uh, advisory services and sustainability. And then the heart of our work and the focus of today is our sustainability transition labs, which we have three. You can check out our energy futures lab, our natural capital lab, and of course, um, our circular economy innovation lab. And the reason that we do this work with the labs is really to deal with what we call wicked problems. So these are challenges with no easy solution where no one private or public sector actor can change or influence the system on their own. And where there's sometimes some tension and discord, and you, know, you can imagine that with our Alberta Energy Futures Lab, where there's a lot of polarized perspectives around what the future of energy systems, and where solving the issue really requires some fundamental changes to the system itself. It's not just um, a matter of a few new uh, tweaks. And in this context, these, our labs have been designed to tackle these challenges by helping to identify and scale innovations uh, helping to shift the, the rules of the game both within and across organizations and build awareness, understanding, and new narratives about what's possible and about the, the need for action. So of course, the circular economy is one of these uh, wicked problems and the core question we're tackling 
is how we accelerate the transition to a low carbon circular economy in Ontario and Canada and more broadly. And by a circular economy, we really mean um, a, a world without waste and a world where we've really optimized the value of all of our products and goods and materials. And, and that means working towards a regenerative, regenerative economy, one that thrives within nature's limits, that's characterized by circular products and materials designed for multiple lives and repeated profitable cycles of reuse, repair, and recycling, and one where there's really efficient production and consumption that's powered by closed loop manufacturing, renewable resources, and low carbon energy sources. And ultimately, that's about um, delivering the highest value and utility um, from the products and materials we use, rather than losing a lot of that utility through uh, disposal processes. So here you get a sense of, of what's been, how that, um, that idea of the linear versus the circular economy, you know, our, our current economy is predominantly, predominantly linear in terms of the flow of, of resources from natural resources through to disposal. And the circular economy aims to close the loop and create more closed loop uh, value systems and supply chains where materials and products are um, maintained for over the long term, where they are reused after first use, uh, are shared or redistributed through sharing processes like Airbnb and other uh, aspects of sharing economy through, uh, and at the end of their, their first useful life cycle, they can be recycled or remanufactured or repurposed, and then are also through or for organic materials can go through composting or biochemical feedstocks. And by doing this, we're maximizing the, the value that can be attained from our materials and products, and we're also um, minimizing the ecological consequences. So the drivers for a circular economy are many. I won't go into these in, in great detail today, but they can be three broad categories. First is an economic driver. This is a trillion dollar opportunity globally, a multi-billion dollar opportunity for Ontario. Uh, a second driver are the ecological tipping points that we're approaching around climate change, around um, ecosystem degradation, um, and biodiversity challenges that if, if we don't shift our economy, we're going to run into significant problems. And then also the emergence of disruptive technologies and business models that are really driving a shift towards a different type of economy. So for all these reasons, we really see the circular economy as being inevitable um, and uh, extremely achievable and also extremely profitable for our communities and for our businesses. So Ontario is well positioned as well as Canada to become a global leader of the circular economy, circular economy but we do have to take some significant action to kind of catch up and uh, establish stronger leadership positions. And to do that requires some strategic systemic changes, which require new ways of collaborating and working together. Um, and that's really where we come in as a, a collaborative initiative to help businesses in the private sector um, identify new types of solutions and scale them up. So our mission is accelerating this transition through have characterizing and identifying the opportunities for governments and businesses then bringing them together through collaborative processes to accelerate the most promising ideas, whether those are initiatives to address systemic barriers to innovation um, and to the circular economy, whether those are innovation moonshots, real um, uh, game-changing ideas that can kind of dramatically accelerate this transition, or simply helping organizations shift towards more circular services, products, and policies. And then we also work to build momentum for change through outreach and education and engagement with different stakeholders and groups throughout the province and the country. And the, the real core of our work are our rapid labs and fellowships. And these are processes that bring together uh, leaders and innovators from across the economy to come together in a collaborative kind of multi-month process to develop a shared vision and understanding for the future in a circular economy and to then work on strategic initiatives uh, that can help achieve that vision to then work on uh, enabling innovation within their own organizations and building a broader awareness and commitment to it and the focus of our conversation today is on our printed paper packaging rapid lab which occurred in the fall it's our first major event it involved these 25 fantastic people from uh, different parts of ontario and from regulators, uh, to producers, to retailers, the whole kind of range of the value chain, who came together over a series of five workshops over two months to develop uh, a shared understanding 
of the system, of the printed paper packaging system and the current barriers and challenges. And then developed a shared vision and set of innovation pathways for achieving it, which we're going to go into now. And then also start to work on collaborating together. So testing and prototyping different ideas and initiatives that they could work on and, and working on, uh, on forging some long-term partnerships. So we had great feedback from that and our main output was this vision for the future of printed paper and packaging in Ontario, which we were pleased to release um, just a, uh, a week ago or so. And that's of course available for, for download on our website and there's lots of information there. So what I'll do is I'll give a very quick overview some, of some of the pieces of this and then we'll jump over to our panelists. So the first off, the first front part of this is really articulating a vision of where we're trying, of where we think printed paper and packaging needs to go in the future to both um, thrive and to align with the circular economy imperative. And that the vision really had two overarching themes, one of functionality, the importance that packaging, printed paper packaging in the future needs to continue to, to meet its requirements in terms of function, in terms of marketing and branding, in terms of, of safety, efficiency and performance, and that's, that's paramount. Packaging has uh, a really important set of functions and purposes it has to achieve that can't be compromised um, by the imperatives of, of, of sustainability or the environment. But there are pathways to achieving that and being aligned with sustainability, the second pillar of the vision, which is really around maximizing value and utility through uh, some of the themes we've talked about already, supporting multiple cycles of use, through refurbishing and repurposing and recycling, so having packages, packaging designed from the, from the outset to be able to be uh, repurposed and recycled, uh, through produced through efficient processes that reduce materials um, where possible, that are able to support reintegrating biological materials to the biosphere, respect social equity, and align with science-based principles for sustainability. And in articulating this vision, there, it's accompanied by a, a broad description of success, a number of different characteristics that um, we expect to see in, in 2030 uh, if we are on track for achieving this mission. And that ranges from ensuring that we have strong markets that reflect the true costs and value of materials so that um, you know, many packaging materials don't have end markets right now and, and that's gonna need to be an important area of work. Um, where the, from a right through from the design uh, to the use of these materials that we've really shifted and reconceptualized um, waste in organizations so that um, as groups like some of our partners, Celestica, have done where you've really re actually literally removed it from the nomenclature and the vocabulary of the organization. We've radically reduced emissions. We've created a, a level playing field for, for sustainable products and, um, and materials and a whole other a range of characteristics of success that you can dive into in more detail. In the report. And then we use this vision to work backwards, to, to backcast if, if that's where we want to be in 2030, and this is the heart of, of the work that the Natural Step does, uh, is to backcast from that to where we are right now and look at what are the innovation pathways, what are the big strategies that are needed to get from where we are right now to work towards achieving that vision. And the group identified four broad innovation pathways. And I should say that this this vision document was the result of this collaborative process and all the input from all these different um, leaders. It was a really uh, engaging and um, cooperative process. So the four innovation areas, innovation pathways that were identified were, were you know, rethinking waste to create a circular economy culture, optimizing circular design and production processes, strengthening province-wide recovery systems and adopting public and private sector policies. Um, on the rethinking waste and creating a circular economy culture, there's a real need um, to engage consumers uh, around the opportunities of the circular economy and, and how to, um, and what types of packaging options and processing to look for. Engaging businesses and enabling collaboration across value chains to uh, create this, the, the set of conditions needed to shift in that direction. Uh, the second, set of innovation pathways is really around optimizing design and production processes. So these are the, the core shifts in business strategy from product life extension, so looking at uh, designing packaging for multiple life. Um, you know, again, our partner Celestica, for example, with um, recovering and repairing and reusing um, shipping pallets, for example. Shifting towards circular supply chains where you're using uh, re recovered, recycled materials in the production of packaging. And I know, uh, 
some of our partners interface and Unilever can speak to their work with, with using recycled materials um, and even interface taking uh, recovered fishing nets uh, from the ocean and, and incorporating them into new carpet. Uh, shifting towards package optimization to really make sure that we're, we're doing things in, in an efficient way and looking at all these areas around the resource efficiency of production processes. The third area was around strengthening province-wide recovery systems for all printed paper and packaging materials. We don't have uh, a standard system throughout the province um, where different materials are collected right now in different uh, regions. So how can we shift towards a standard PDP collection process? How can we invest in the advanced processing technology? I'm sure Jake will speak to that um, when, he, when he's up in a moment. And are there, is there a need for uh, more alternative collection systems? You know, things like we have with uh, the beer store return, the deposit return system for liquor bottles that's been effective at recovering 96% you know, of beer bottles. Are there other kind of return to retail type processes that would complement the systems we have in place right now? And the fourth area was really around adopting, adopting sorry, um, public and private sector policies that support the circular economy. So these are our metrics. Um, so shifting how we're, we're, we're tracking and measuring and reporting on this in the province, looking at industry standards and guidelines, um, they're like the new zero waste uh, standard, um, investing in circular economy innovation and, and enabling that innovation within our companies. Aligning procurement practices to support the circular economy and aligning other government policies and regulations with that. So that's a quick overview of the circular economy, um, uh, the, the vision we have for printed paper and packaging. And before I go to our, our panels, I just want to ask a couple more uh, poll questions. Um, and oh my goodness, did I leave this the poll results up this whole time? I'm not sure if I did. Hopefully that wasn't in anyone's way. Um, what I wanted to do was just um, ask people for their, first their, their understanding of the, the circular economy. I'm just gonna open this polling now for yourself and for, so our panelists can know. Um, just select whether your level of understanding is that you don't know anything about the circular economy, uh, you feel you know the basics, you have a moderate level of understanding or you feel you're a real um, expert in the circular economy. So. I'll just give a moment for people to, to fill in their votes. So just give another 10 seconds for a few people to, the last few people to vote. Great, I'm going to end polling here. So what you can see is we have about 7% of people say they don't know anything, 40% feel they know the basics, about 42% at the moderate level, and then we've got eight people or 14% as experts. I also um, want to get a sense of people's reactions to um, the vision and innovation pathways that we've just shown. So here I'd like to get people's sense of, you know, We've presented this vision and innovation pathways for printed paper and packaging. Do you? Pardon me, I dropped the phone. Uh, I'm not sure if that counts like dropping the mic in the, in the music production, but my apologies for that. Um, so whether you think it's, uh, this vision is too ambitious, whether you think it's the right level of ambition of what we need, or whether there's anyone who thinks it's just not ambitious enough, it doesn't go far enough in terms of what's needed uh, for the future of printed paper and packaging. So I'll just give another few seconds for the last people, people to, to vote. Okay, great. So here, uh, what we can see is we have about 7% uh, who says too ambitious should be scaled back. 88% um, around saying this is the right level of ambitious and a few people saying um, that it's not ambitious enough, we need to go further. So I think with that background context, um, what we can do now is launch into our panelists. We're gonna start with uh, Jake Westerhoff um, from Canada Fibers, and then we'll go to John Coyne from Unilever, uh, Ian Ferguson from Chandler Packaging, and then Brendan Seal. So I'm going to invite uh, Jake to unmute himself and um, give us his thoughts. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hello to everyone on the webinar. Uh, so firstly, Chris, 
uh, I'd like to congratulate you and Danielle and everybody at the Natural Step for this initiative, the energy and the effort that's gone into this to date. Um, I think it's quite remarkable. So uh, kudos to all of you there. Um, so the circular economy and, and Canada fibers. Fundamentally, um, the circular economy and the uh, and the and the use of uh, of materials as secondary resources, um, you know, is a core principle uh, for who we are as a company. Uh, we take discarded materials and we give them life again. Um, so the, the principles of the circular economy certainly align with uh, with our beginnings. Uh, they align with our kind of core values. And they absolutely align with our forward strategy uh, to provide closed loop recycling systems. And the graphic that I'm that I'm speaking over today is sort of our circularity with respect to Canada Fibers and the Urban Resource Group and how we see ourselves as being collectors of materials, recovering these materials in our MRFs. Uh, and then sending those materials on to the recycling parts of our company to be made into new products and or uh, materials to be made into new products. Um, so we certainly are, um, you know, it wasn't a difficult decision for us to come and participate within this, uh, within this group of 25 individuals. Um, Couple of comments toward the vision statement that was created out of uh, out of the Rapid Lab. Um, it uh, you know it it speaks very clearly to providing sort of sustainable material management solutions, and it promotes continuous investment in technology and the enrichment of people through advanced training. Um, these are all things that we endeavor and uh, to do each day. We are very much a company that is i believe at the forefront of technology development within our space uh, we've relied on it we rely on it a lot today we'll rely on it more tomorrow uh, it's an important part of what we think about uh, as we try and become more effective and efficient in in what we're doing um, technology is is great but having people, uh, talented people, and, and continue to invest in your, in your human resources is absolutely key. So very much aligns with the types of things that we want to do. Um, the innovation pathways that have been set, um, I think a couple of comments that I'd like to make there, and I'm trying to be as brief as possible because I know there are others coming after me and lots of questions, I'm sure. Um, I think firstly, uh, the Rapid Lab was able to create a safe forum for a multi, the multi-stakeholder discussion that we need to have on transitioning printed paper and package to 100% funded producer supported EPR program. Um, I think this is a key accomplishment uh, of the group. Uh, I got a real sense during the lab that there was consensus on this and, and that's an important uh, that's an important result as a result of the, of the lab that we had in November uh, and earlier this year. Um, and then kind of lastly on the innovation pathways, we're certainly prepared to further invest um, our resources to realize the sort of economic and the environmental benefits in the shift to a more circular economy. Um, whether that be technology development um, or, you know, just infrastructure and asset development in Ontario. Um, I do feel that um, we have to be sure that we have the right set of business conditions in place in the province to ensure that these uh, investments can be made and can be made successfully. Um, and I think government can help us in that. Uh, so, you know, sustainable packaging uh, as kind of maybe the last comment, sustainable packaging for, for us means using renewable raw materials. Um, it means that packaging and products need to be recyclable, um, that materials in their manufacturing would be ethically sourced and that they have post-consumer content. Um, and when you do those things, I think the circularity uh, movement, if you will, or the circular economy sort of uh, does its thing. 
So that was kind of what I had to say, Chris, as far as my comments and what brought us to this. Great, thanks very much, Jake. And, and of course, people can use the Q&A functionality to submit questions for Jake and for others, and we'll, we'll read those out as we uh, get to the Q&A part. I'd like to invite um, John Coyne from Unilever to share some thoughts from Unilever perspective on this work. Hi, Chris, Hi. And, good and good afternoon to everybody. Um, uh, Jake, thank you for your comments, and I'd like to echo what you said uh, about thanking uh, Chris and Danielle and the natural step. We have certainly, with this process, stimulated a new discussion uh, around printed paper and packaging, and I think more broadly around uh, what it is that people are beginning to conceive of as a circular economy, but as the poll just a few minutes ago demonstrate, uh, we are at different points of understanding in terms of that circular economy. It is absolutely imperative for companies like ours to ensure that we are having uh, new discussions about new business models and a new way of thinking uh, when it comes to um, the whole notion of disposal. Because I venture to suggest that in the next few years, the notion of disposing of packaging, paper, or other materials is going to become increasingly difficult for people to justify. So there is now, I think, uh, more appetite for taking a longer view of these things, that the consumption cycle when it comes to our products, whether we're in the fast-moving consumer goods or any other kind of industry that has disposal as uh, an element of consumer use, I think we're all becoming uh, better versed at taking the longer view of the impact of those cycles. And while we use terminology like closed loop, and other uh, types of expressions that seems to emerge out of these things, I think there is a developing belief in the substance of what it is that we're talking about. Now, that said, there is a great deal of work needed to be done and a great deal of effort that needs to go in to creating the scale and the scope associated with that belief and that culture. And that's one of the four streams that Chris was alluding to a little while ago. But why Unilever? Well, 10 years or five years ago, uh, we set uh, an ambitious goal to cut the waste associated with the disposal of our products in half by 2020. Five years into that program, we're down by 29%. And we're confident enough about the work that we're doing in this uh, space that earlier this year in January, we announced that we would extend our uh, sustainable living plan commitment to address packaging waste in a more dramatic way. And that is that by 2025, as a stimulus, if you will, for our entire industry to accelerate this circular economy view, we would like to ensure that all of our plastic packaging is designed to be reusable, recyclable, or compostable. Now that's on a global basis, and there are various different challenges in different jurisdictions, but all of those challenges engage us in the four streams that Chris is alluding to. So it is incredibly important for us not only to be a participant in this, but to be drivers, guiders, leaders, but also very much participants in this because none of this is gonna happen with individual companies doing this alone. It is incredibly important for us to be accelerating our transitions in this, and that means that we need to do more than just transact cooperatively among ourselves. We must design, as part of this process, a real collaboration. And that is a collaboration among players in industry, but it is a true collaboration and a modern collaboration between business and government. Because with the, without the appropriate regulatory systems, we will never design the infrastructures that are appropriate and necessary for creating a circular economy in the broadest sense. And when it, without having that appropriate collaboration, we will never move ourselves fast enough towards that closed loop. And those of us in industry should be more than willing to participate in this because it is completely consistent with how it is that we want to run our businesses generally. We do not want waste in our businesses. We do not want additional costs in our businesses. We want to be highly regarded by the consumers whose needs we are trying to address with our products. So for all of those reasons and others, participating in this is essential. 
not only to the success of our enterprise, but I think to the success of what it is that we want to achieve over the longer term. And that brings us, of course, to how it is that we relate to our consumers. So whether it's our, com our company selling consumer goods or another company selling any other type of product or delivering any other kind of service, this debate and this discussion about the closed loop notion of a circular economy is going to become increasingly essential to how it is that we think about our businesses. And we're going to have to do that at a scale that is truly meaningful for the consumers that we want to serve. So I want to thank again Chris and uh, his colleagues at The Natural Step and indicate that together with The Natural Step and our partnership with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that we have renewed for another three years, we're looking forward to a broad-based discussion and implementation of all kinds of new solutions for how it is that we're going to move forward in this space. And that's where I would like to leave it for the five minutes that I have been allotted. Chris, thank you. Thanks, John. We'll have time for to hear more from you as we get into the questions and answers. Uh, uh, it's wonderful to be working with you as a partner. Uh, I'd like to invite Ian from Chandler Packaging to say a few words about uh, their work and, uh, and, and their perspective on this vision. And uh, then we'll come to Brendan from Ikea and then we'll do some questions. Uh, Ian, over to you. Hi, thanks very much, Chris. And uh, just like the other panelists, I want to thank uh, The Natural Step for uh, putting together a fantastic program. I think participating in that uh, Rapid Lab was a great experience for me and uh, it was just a great, uh, it was so well run and, and really, really well organized. So uh, Chandler Packaging, we're a smaller packaging manufacturer. We are uh, a small or medium-sized enterprise and we're in Mississauga, Ontario. So what we do day to day is manufacture the flexible plastic packaging that uh, you, you see in the marketplace. Uh, we also have a small consulting service that offers advice to users of packaging and manufacturers of packaging. So our role is to make the, uh, the, the stand-up pouches or bags or uh, other uh, plastic film products that you see in grocery stores packaging food uh, or that uh, goes over the, the CPG products, the, the health and beauty or pharma products that you buy. And then we also have some uh, industrial customers as well. So what we're making is a product that has uh, lots of use and utility, but it does have challenges fitting into the circular economy in terms of its second life or its, uh, its use after the initial use because our products are very lightweight. Uh, it takes up thousands and thousands of them to, to make um, to make a. They're they're very light and weight, so they're they're complicated to collect. They're often composed of multiple materials, so uh, there are challenges uh, in reusing them. So part of our interest in participating in the Rapid Lab was to understand how we could fit into the circular economy. Certainly, we see a great role for, for flexible plastic packaging. Uh, in the circular economy in terms of its ability to lightweight and reduce material use, which is a priority uh, in the circular economy. But it's that uh, second life, that recyclability that, that continues to be a challenge. Uh, maybe we can go to the next slide here. So uh, we got some great learnings from the Rapid Lab. Uh, I think the key learning that we picked up on is that the the, the, the printed paper and packaging system is extremely complicated. And uh, it's like the cliche about the, uh, the, the people who are vision impaired and they're, they're trying to understand uh, about the elephant that they're touching and they're each uh, feeling a different part of it and they, they, they can't uh, really put the parts together. So the, the municipal government, the provincial government sees, sees one part Brand owners and product manufacturers see other parts. In the case of Unilever, they might see uh, very deeply. In the case of IKEA, they might have lots of insights. Uh, but also, there are, there are tons of uh, medium-sized producers of products in, in the uh, Ontario economy, and their vision for the whole circle, your circular cycle uh, could be a bit more constrained. Um, retailers have a part to play. And then of course there are people like us who are supplying that demand for packaging. Uh, one key learning that, that we've picked up on is that many of our customers are not sure what's going on with the legislation. I don't think that's 
to blame anybody making legislation out there. It's really just uh, in, unless you have a sustainability department full time at uh, at a company, it's difficult to get visibility on the implications of some of these legislative changes. Okay, I think we can um, we can progress to to the final slide here. So um, understanding that it's our role to help inform our customers of what these changes are going to be uh, and, and, and trying to anticipate what their needs are, we're reaching out to our sales team to try and understand what the level of knowledge is of our, of our customer base. And I think the poll that was, uh, that was administered earlier in this webinar shows that there is some knowledge out there generally about the circular economy, but uh, from our experience, understanding, helping brand owners understand what that means for them, uh, they're not entirely up on where it's going to take them. So we want to continue that conversation. Uh, that means continuing to work on the projects we started in the, in the rapid lab. And we need to talk to our stakeholders and get them up to speed. So we're considering an outreach strategy uh, to educate our customers that is going to uh, help us understand, uh, help them understand what the circular economy's impact on their business is going to be and uh, what that might do to the fees that they're paying in, in, to the sustainability or the um, stewardship system now. We also want to understand what they expect from us in terms of the help we can provide. So does that mean they want us to bring new products to the table, to the market? Does that mean they're looking for new advisory services that help them understand where they are uh, right now and what they could move to? And then it also means planning for a circular future. So uh, one of the frustrations that we are uh, that, that, that we've picked up on from our customer base is they often spend time and effort investigating new materials or, or new products for packaging that cannot be recycled, that cannot be collected, cannot be turned into something else. So there's an issue of uh, what can we, they, they want to throw their money at something useful and, and see the return on it in terms of sustainability. But uh, if there's no process in place to collect some of the innovative new materials that build themselves as compostable or, or, or degradable or, or whatever in the marketplace or, or recyclable, uh, then they're, they're not really uh, putting their investment to the best use. We also want to talk about uh, uh, tools. So we may, we may have a role to play in helping them understand their impact uh, on the system as a whole. And that's really all I wanted to say about the uh, our participation in the Rapid Lab. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, again, you can submit your questions for Ian through the Q and A. And so our, our fourth panelist is Brendan Seal from IKEA to, to give their perspective as a, one of Canada's leading retailers. And um, then we'll go to a bit of a Q and A, and then we'll talk about where Seal goes from here. Brendan. Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate it. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on the, the call with all of you today. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, my remarks will, will be somewhat forward thinking as we emerge from the, the printed paper and packaging rapid lab component um, into sort of the broader, uh, the broader circular economy innovation lab, which Chris alluded to. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the next steps for, for the program as a whole uh, afterward. Um, so what you're looking at here is a picture of our founder, Ingvar Kamprad, and, and he had a vision, which you see here, to create a better everyday life for the many people. And I think this is a really powerful vision for us, and it speaks to businesses um, really operating with purpose, a higher purpose at heart. And I think, you know, now more than ever, as we see uh, the conditions of, uh, of our political discourse around the world, um, we see the, the trust in, in large institutions uh, really lagging. Uh, that business really needs to step forward and lead. And as John indicated, you know, that, that involves partnering with, with governments in new ways and, and more modern ways and also with the NGO community and all of our stakeholders to really explore how we can be a force for good in the world, how we can be positive forces uh, in society. And ask ourselves questions like not only what are we good at, but what are we good for? And, and so these are the kinds of conversations that we're having internally at IKEA quite often and, and pushing and exploring this, this vision of creating a better everyday life for the many people. A better everyday uh, may not just be having a nice living room in your home. 
and the many people may not uh, just be the customers who walk through our doors and shop at IKEA. Uh, it could be the people in our supply chains, uh, in our communities, and those that aren't even here on this planet yet. So uh, these are powerful questions that I think we can all ask ourselves. Chris, to the next slide, please, if you could. Uh, a few years back, and then you could just uh, bring these three bullet points up on as, on as well. We've this uh, strategy that we adopted uh, a few years ago called People and Planet Positive is is really our, our articulation of of the impact that we want to have in the world. And these three change drivers that you see on the right hand side of the screen are, are what push us forward in our work. So uh, to to inspire and enable a more sustainable life at home, uh, this really looks at the impact that we can have in in influencing our our customers' lives in their in their homes to use less energy and water and, and reduce waste and live a healthier lifestyle. We want to operate our business in a way that, that we are um, resource and energy independent and all of the commodities and energy that goes into our business, uh, we're sourcing those, those things in a positive way and having a net positive impact in all those ways. And then to create a better life for people and communities who are impacted by our business. And the reason I thought this slide was important to show uh, today is that uh, our work to create a more circular IKEA and work toward a circular economy will touch all of these areas. Uh, with customers, we have opportunities to create new relationships and touch points where uh, we can add value to their uh, throughout a product's life cycle, not just at the beginning when we first sell the product. Uh, through our operations, you know, we'll see a decreasing demand for virgin raw materials, uh, which will be so important for us as we continue to grow our business over the coming decades. Uh, and then through the community work that we're doing, you know, things like job creation and, and productivity, resource productivity in our economy will only benefit the communities that we operate in. So we see the circular economy as a key driver of progress in all of these areas in our sustainability strategy so that we can have a positive force uh, in the world. To the next slide, Chris, if you wouldn't mind. Thanks very much. So this, this slide here uh, is a very simple photo of a, of a take back station we have in, in uh, our store in Coquitlam, British Columbia. And we have a, a station like this in all of our stores across Canada where we're taking back household batteries and light bulbs. And uh, this is a program that we've been operating since about 2001 to, to sort of take responsibility for the, the products that we're selling into the marketplace. And these ones in particular, of course, uh, involve some hazardous materials that it's important to recover and, and recycle responsibly. So this is one of the programs that we're operating today to sort of support our customers in, and working towards a circular economy in our business. We've also launched a program uh, to take back used mattresses from our customers. So with the purchase of a new mattress and, and delivery of that mattress, we'll, we'll take back an old one and have it broken down into parts. And, and those commodities then get used in other industrial applications as well. And we're looking at you know, other offerings that we can introduce in the future. But if you think about the, um, the diagram that was shown before with the circular economy model, it's not just in the recycling of the packaging, but also how we can extend product life and reuse things and, um, and support refer repair and refurbishment and customization perhaps to, to really um, decrease the demand for raw materials by extending that product life and then also creating those circular flows of materials when products do reach the end of their useful lives as well. But this photo also, you know, even though it's a very simple picture, it, it reminds me of, of the collaborative spirit that is really required as in, in moving toward uh, a circular economy. And I think, uh, you know, we really recognize that we're unable to achieve our circular economy ambitions if we operate alone. We are going to need to partner with others. We're going to need to ask different questions of our suppliers and our partners. Um, and we feel that by collaborating and participating in initiatives like the Circular Economy Innovation Lab, uh, we can sort of create a, a rising tide uh, of, of progress toward a truly circular economy in Ontario. And, and as we know, a uh, you know, rising tide raises all ships. So I would encourage others to, uh, to explore the possibility of, of getting involved in, in this initiative and, and others like it so that we can advance this discourse and this dialogue um, to, to promote uh, progress toward a more circular economy. So I'd like to thank the other uh, panelists who have participated in the print, printed paper and packaging rapid lab alongside IKEA. And then also uh, just a, a quick uh, hat tip to the natural step and, and their team for the great work that they've done in, in convening this group of uh, unusual uh, suspects, I guess you'd say unusual partners uh, to really push the conversation forward. So thanks very much. And I look forward to uh, the questions that may come uh, from the attendees of today's webinar. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Brendan, and thanks to all of our panelists. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the next steps for SEAL, and then we'll get, jump into our Q&A. I noticed there's a few questions already, and 
Um, Brendan and others are welcome to, and other panelists are also to, welcome to throw in some, some written responses, some of those questions if they're through the online platform. And others are welcome to post more questions there. So I'll quickly talk about where SEAL goes from here um, because you may have some questions about that as well, and then we'll go into the Q&A. So what um, we learned in 2016, and I think our panelists have kind of echoed, is that one, the time is really right for the circular economy uh, here in Canada. We, we've seen this massive momentum internationally. Uh, we've seen media uptake pick, picked up within, um, within Canada over the last year around the circular economy and a tremendous interest in our program. So the opportunity and benefits are real and, and leaders are, are really interested and ready to invest. Uh, two, as I think our panelists have echoed, we see that collaboration is really essential to make this shift work. You know, as, as one of the opening slides said, this is viewed as being perhaps the biggest uh, opportunity, the biggest shift to the way we do, um, the way our economy functions in 250 years. So this is a very significant undertaking and we need to have uh, people collaborating all across different sectors of value chains. And then the third lesson we've had from this first year is that there really is a critical role that a group like SEAL can play here in terms of convening this forum, um, developing a shared vision and using that to backcast uh, the different strategies and, and innovative projects that are needed to move things forward, supporting strategic collaborative actions and, and really building capacity for circular innovation. Um, so as we go into 2017, we will be launching a, a fellowship which will take the, this process we use for the Rapid Lab and expand it to look at the entire economy over the period of a year. I'll speak to that in a moment. We'll be launching a number of circular economy innovation workshops um, for individual companies and for value chains. And we'll be continuing to help uh, advance the work on printed paper and packaging. There are a number of collaborative initiatives that have, have come out of that. Um, rapid Lab that we'll be working to, to support in the coming months. And then in support of all those three, we'll be developing different resources, uh, case studies and guides, et cetera. We'll be doing some outreach, speaking at events and offering a webinar series on different aspects of the circular economy and developing partnerships, including uh, both uh, uh, local partnerships with Ontario with different organizations, um, including uh, different design innovation centers and international partnerships with groups like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to bring their resources and knowledge into the Canadian context. I'll mention briefly the fellowship because that's something we're very excited about. Um, you've heard today about uh, from different panelists who are part of our two-month process on printed paper and packaging. They brought together 25 leaders. Uh, we'll be launching uh, later this year in April, we'll be launching an application for people to join um, our fellowship that will look at the uh, transition of Ontario's economy as a whole, looking at uh, both the broad-based shift and some specific themes and sectors, which some of which are needed to be determined. In particular, we will have printed paper and packaging continued through the fellowship. Um, we'll be looking to develop a vision and innovation pathways and set of projects and materials for this broader transition. Um, so taking what you see with, with the printed paper and packaging work and expanding that to look at other aspects of the economy. And so we, we welcome people to join us to in this fellowship process. We'll be looking for a great diversity of organizations to participate. Um, We'll also be launching these innovation workshops. We'll aim to uh, take some of the processes and tools that we used effectively in our rapid lab and some of the uh, training tools developed internationally on the circular economy to help organizations kind of identify, and test, and prioritize their own circular economy innovations. And these workshops can be structured for individual businesses and also for, for value chains. So if, you, if you're um, an, an organization that has a few strategic partners and you want to go through this process together, that's something we can, we can look at. And usually it'll be a, a format of, of multiple sessions over a few months so that people are actually doing some prototyping typing and testing individually within their, within their teams. Um, and so we welcome you to, to join us in this work. You can sign up for a newsletter. Uh, you can contact me about uh, becoming a sponsor, convening partner. And you can uh, stay tuned uh, to apply for the fellowship and be part of some of these, these projects as we go forward. So that's a little bit about where we're going next. What I'd like to do now is, is, is open it for questions. And we have a few already that have come in. Um, so I'm just going to open that myself. Uh, we had a, uh, a first question around, what does all this mean? Uh, let's start with a really tough question. Thanks, Aaron. What does this mean uh, for the bottled water industry? Does this actually mean the end of the bottled water industry? And, and Jake has, has volunteered to tackle this question first. Uh, Jake? <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. Um, um, so, uh, 
no, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't mean the end of the bottled water industry. I, I think um, there is a uh, there is a, a time and place when um, getting a drink in a a, a, a bottle is, uh, is 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 convenient and necessary. I think what the I think what the Rapid Lab did do though is that it sort of resurface the whole notion of refillable uh, water bottles to the point where we even have a special project that's looking at trying to uh, promote further the uh, the use of uh, refillable containers uh, for water um, how's that Chris Thanks, Jake, and, and I'll, I'll welcome other panelists to, to jump in on this question too. I mean, I think, as Jake alluded to, this is um, there. When we we look at this vision, there are two pieces: there's the sustainability of our printed paper packaging products, and then there's the functionality. And as Jake alluded to, it there are times and situations where uh, bottled water, prepackaged bottled water, is the is the right solution that meets those those functionalities. And there's other times when um, there are better alternatives that one can use. So uh, I don't, it's not about uh, the, the end of bottled water, but it may be a shift in how people get their water and how frequently they use different modalities. Um, Chris, Chris, it's John, may I add something to that? Um, yeah. uh, no, I don't think it's gonna mean the end of the, the bottled water industry for that reason alone. I think what this tends to call out for us though, is that it is very important for us as businesses and by extension governments as well, to make sure that consumers are extremely well educated about the full implications of their consumption choice. And sometimes that's around things like uh, packaging and where, did, uh, where does the packaging go and what happens to it and so on. And sometimes it relates to the materials that are inside the packaging and sometimes that's water and sometimes that's other types of ingredients. Some of them are chemicals, some of them are food ingredients. And so I think what we need to make sure of when we talk about the circular economy beyond printed paper and packaging is making sure that consumers who exercise choice with their wallets uh, are fully informed about the full implications of their consumption choices. And that's part of the journey towards a truly circular economy because it touches all elements of a product, not just the packaging of the product. Thanks for that, John. And I think there's a bunch of, we could probably say a lot more on that particular question, but I'd like to, to get to a couple other ones. In particular, there's a couple of questions uh, that Brendan wanted to answer related to, to retailers. There's one around, what is the role of responsibility of retailers in the circular economy from, from Aaron? And then there was also a question around um, plywood using mushrooms as fiber and whether IKEA is looking at that. Brendan, do you want to speak to those two questions? Sure. So just uh, the first question from Aaron about the role or responsibility of retailers in regards to the circular economy. I think, um, you know, it's first and foremost, it's, that could potentially be a very broad question because it depends entirely on, on uh, the retailer and the types of products that are being sold. But I think it's important for retail um, to be at the table in these discussions, certainly. Um, today, retail is very much a, a one-way street. Uh, if I can call it that, and and so product is sold, and and it's sort of see you later, enjoy your product, and that may not be the case in the future. It might be that retail becomes more of a two-way street, uh, or perhaps there's an opportunity for return to retail schemes like what we see with the uh, the brewers of Canada. Um, perhaps that's that's one way to deal with packaging, or or indeed even products going forward in the future. So I think retailers need to be considering what. Uh, the circular economy might mean for them and, and be engaged in these types of discussions to see what the opportunities might be. Um, I hinted at a few already about uh, about how we can um, create new touch points and deepen our relationships with our customers throughout the product's life cycle. And, and so that could be through repair and reuse, and it could be through secondhand sale or, or facilitating donation uh, and, and reuse of a product that way. Uh, or even being the hub for where the, the goods come back to eventually be recycled. And that may not be appropriate in all cases, but in some it will be. So I hope that helps um, to answer your question, Aaron. Uh, this, the second question there that specifically um, refers to IKEA from Ben about the um, uh, the mushroom fiber. We uh, um, are exploring and, and, and working with a partner on the development of mycelium as a, as a packaging type uh, to replace polystyrene. We have not been 
really looking at it necessarily as a fiber for uh, for product itself, but more in the packaging side. So uh, kind of as, as a replacement for polystyrene uh, foam is, is where we are looking at using it. Great, thanks for that, Brendan. And maybe we've got, um, I'll do one more question, uh, which, which Jake can speak to. And then I, I wanted to give um, uh, Ian an opportunity to comment on what we've heard so far. So there's another question here about the role of, of the actual recycling companies in this model and, and, and what their role is and whether they are working with product stewards and packaging companies or if they're just there to clean up the mess at the lowest price. Uh, that's the question from an anonymous viewer. Uh, Jake, your thoughts on that? And then Ian, we'll turn to you for your commentary on what you've heard so far. Yeah, and, and to be brief, Chris, uh, certainly the clean up a mess at the lowest price um, is, a, uh, is a framework of the past. Um, I would say in my 30 years in this business, or almost 30 years in this business, uh, in the past five years, I've never seen more interaction between uh, companies involved in the recycling space and uh, product stewards and packaging companies. Uh, there's been, and, and it, this predates even the work that, you know, uh, we've done here in the Rapid Lab over the last six months. There has been dialogue. There is an interest, and I think John articulated it very clearly. There is an interest in uh, companies providing these types of choices, uh, recyclability, using recycled content, these types of choices to consumers. And I think that's led to the discussions, uh, as I say, has been happening for a number of years uh, between recycling companies and stewards and packaging, uh, packaging manufacturers. Thanks for that. And that's, that's a great segue um, to Ian, from your perspective as a producer, um, how do you see those relationships shifting uh, in your work as from the producers and the recyclers? Uh, and if you have a comment on kind of what the circular economy means for certain packaging types as well, as we've we've had that question around the bottled uh, water. Um, yeah, so your opportunity to comment here, Ian. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, I don't think that the circular economy means an end to any particular type of packaging, uh, because I think that there is a role to play. Like I think every, every type of packaging that's currently on the market has a role to play in some certain circumstance. Uh, it may, it, I don't think a move to the circular economy alone is enough to uh, kill off the bottled water. And I don't think it will, it will kill off the bottled water industry or any industry. I think um, the circular economy opens up opportunities for, for companies providing products like bottled water to look at their business model and say, well, you know, what, what am I, I'm selling this water. It comes in this thing. How, is there an opportunity to, to separate one and the other in the consumer's mind and just be a water provider and, and the, the bottle part is something that I offer to the consumer on a deposit basis or a subscription basis. Or there are all sorts of, the wonderful thing about the circular economy, it doesn't, it doesn't have to mean winners and losers, this type of packaging, that type of packaging. It's opportunities for everybody in the value chain to rethink how they make their money and, and what they, their definition of a cost uh, versus a profit center is. So from that point of view, uh, sure, it's going to challenge some packaging intensive uh, industries, but I also think it opens up opportunities. I think briefly the role and responsibility of retailers, uh, they have a big role to play along with, uh, with brand owners and along with packaging manufacturers. And I think what we're going to see as we move closer to a circular economy is I think we're going to see uh, retailers ears perk up a little more and I think that uh, just as they've done a deep dive into packaging to understand more about how their uh, how their 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 brand's uh, logo is is communicated faithfully and consistently from package to package or uh, uh, you know to create a consistent brand image I think they're going to dive into circularity as a as, some, as a criterion for packaging purchasing. And I think that can only mean a good thing for, for our, our industry. Thanks so much, Ian. I'm gonna to have to call it to close there. Um, and clearly we have a lot, an, enough room to have a, a longer conversation on this. And we're looking forward to, as we say, offering more webinars over the coming year and more web discussions and uh, really uh, moving this conversation forward as we, we, we expand the scope of our work and scale up our activities this year. So 
I want to thank again our panelists for coming. Um, I put up a slide here with some of our contact information. We also have a, a Twitter handle uh, that Danielle shared. I should have had the slide where we are really um, sharing a lot of different resources around the circular economy. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming. We had 90 people uh, log in today, which is fantastic for our first webinar. We're very pleased and we look forward to continuing this conversation in the year to come.